It is good to be here. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We were looking forward to that other ride, however. <laughs> A little disappointment there, but... <laughs> yeah, I guess we have to go back, don't we? I want to, we're going to be in 2 Peter today, the first chapter, and study a few verses, but we're going to talk about spiritual building blocks. Now, the Bible tells us many times that we're building a spiritual house. Remember, we have the parable about the man who built his house on the sand, the man who built his house on the rock. And, and uh, our, our life is an ongoing process, and the idea of building a spiritual house needs to be an ongoing process. When we get saved, spiritual life doesn't end there. It begins there. Then there's the process of building this life, this, life, this house, into one that meets God's requirements. You all know that when houses are built, normally there's a blueprint. And if you go by the blueprint, the house is built like it's supposed to be built. Unless, of course, the wife tells the architect, oh, I want this changed, I want this changed, I want that changed. You know, which, that's okay. Spiritually speaking, though, God has a blueprint for our life, and that blueprint is our Bible. And God doesn't allow the wife to come in and make changes, nor the husband, nor whomever. We need to build it according to his blueprint so that it will look like what he wants it to look like. And that's what I want to talk about for just a few minutes this morning, about the spiritual building blocks that we have. Now, the passage is actually going to start in verse 5, but to give us a little bit of context and to let us know where we are, we will start from the beginning here. 2 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2 read, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God speaks, the Holy Spirit inspires, Peter writes, and we need to hear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we study your word this morning, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us to hear, to say, and to do. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now I will admit to you from the beginning, I don't confess too many things, but I admit a lot of things, that I'm at a little bit of, a, little bit of a disadvantage because I usually preach serious sermons so that I don't have to pack everything into one sermon that I want to say. Because when I try to pack it, I get a little long-winded, but I'm going to not do that this morning. She promised me she won't let me. <laughs> but let's go back and look at some of the introduction here, just to kind of get a, a, a foundation here. Simon Peter, a servant apostle of Jesus Christ, and of course we know who he was, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. He's talking to Christians. So he's talking to us as Christians today. This is not a salvation passage. This is more of a sanctification package. It's a growing, a maturing. That Christian life must mature. When we first get saved, we're actually spiritual babes. I don't care how old you are, you're a spiritual babe when you first get saved. And you need to grow in the Lord. You need to mature in the Lord. That's what gives us the ability to witness effectively. Romans 10, 17 reads, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Now that's interesting for, to think about Peter writing that back then because they didn't have what we have in the Bible. But they did have most of the Old Testament writings and by this point they did have the life of Christ not in writing but in witness because most of the disciples and the apostles were still alive at this writing or back at this time. 
So he's writing to us just as he was writing to them. Now, there are many things that biblical faith does for us. And, and everybody has faith, but it's not all in God. They're going to have faith in something. A lot of people, that something is, I have faith in me. Well, or I have faith in this or that. Faith is not something that people are unfamiliar with, but it's not often directed toward God, and that's where the Christian needs to direct it. But here's what faith does for us. First of all, it saves us. And then it justifies us. That's part of salvation. Salvation and justification. Remember, justification is just as if I'd never sinned. When God forgives my sins, he wipes them clean. Very some of the deepest sea, the Old Testament tells us. And we don't have to be uh, suffer the punishment of sin, which is eternal damnation once that happens. So it justifies us for heaven. It saves us from hell. It justifies us for heaven. It sanctifies. That's a process. There's a beginning time, but there's a process where we are mature and growing. To be sanctified means to be set apart for sacred service. Those are those special dishes that are in the wife's cabinet that the husband never gets to eat off of <laughs> until company comes. And those are the ones the grandkids can't play with. You know, those little figurines and things. They're set apart for some sacred service. We really are too. As Christians, we are set apart for sacred services. Biblical faith brings healing. Many times we read in the New Testament about people who were healed. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has cleansed you. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ in the New Testament parables that talk about it in the actual healings. Faith strengthens us. Faith cleanses us. It testifies about us. And it solidifies us. The more faith we have, the stronger we are in the Lord. Because we trust Him for more and more and more and more. So that's why biblical faith is important. And it needs to be biblical faith. Okay? Directed toward the right person for all the right reasons. So going on in 2 Peter, he says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. God's going to call us to a holy life. He doesn't call us to a place He doesn't enable us to live. So if He's called us to a holy life, He will enable us to live that holy life. Whatever he's called us to do, he will enable us to do. It's his divine power working through us that enables us to be the Christian that he wants us to be, to be the example. I've just taken a couple of phrases out of three and four here. So that through them, now it's talking about his divine power and then that other passage had to deal with the promises he gave us. Through them, you may escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. If you'll be obedient, if you'll have faith, and you'll live according to Christ, you'll escape hell. And you'll also escape all those evil desires that sometimes cause us trouble in the world. Does that mean they'll never come? No, there's never a promise, by the way, that we won't be tempted. There's never a promise that we won't be tempted. But we do have the promise that no temptation will come to us that we're not able to overcome through the Holy Spirit. Even Christ was tempted, but he overcame the temptation. And if you'll remember how he overcame temptation was from quoting Old Testament Scripture. Now, Satan tempted him with Scripture, too, but it was misquoted Scripture, and we have to be careful for that. That's why it's nice to know your Bible. So if somebody misquotes it or takes it out of context, you say, if you're listening to somebody, you say, no, wait a minute, that's not quite right. That's not how I remember. That doesn't set right in me, because the Holy Spirit will give us discernment as well. Now, here's the text that I really wanted to get to today. There are going to be five or seven things that we're going to talk about that we're to make every effort to, do, to add to our faith. Uh, sometimes I think of this as faith plus. And it's not some new concept I've got. This is from the Bible. But the idea is that this is how we add to our faith so that we can be the kind of Christian the Lord wants us to be. But he says make every effort. Some passages or some translations will say be diligent. Well, that means be persistent. But this idea in the Greek has five concepts. It's diligence, speediness, or the urgency. Don't wait around. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible tells us. Today will be the last day that some people will be alive in a church somewhere. And if they're not a Christian, it will be the last day that they had. Same thing will be tomorrow. They may not be in church tomorrow, but it will be the last time they have to give their life to the Lord before their time of judgment comes in. If they're not a Christian, see, it will be too late. So they need, we need to be urgent. Now, we're urgent according to the Holy Spirit's leading, by the way. We need to be earnest. This needs to be a sincere thing that we're talking about. We need to be sincere in our efforts. We need to be eager. The desire should be there. We should want to be more Christ-like in all that we do. And then we need to be careful. We need to show caution in how we are developing so that we're following the blueprint. We need to be careful not to leave anything out. You know, sometimes those blueprints are pretty complicated. 
and it takes different people. The, the plumber's got a way he reads it, the electrician's got a way he reads it, the carpenter. They, if they want to build it exactly right, they've got to read it right. And one of them might read that and say, no, wait a minute, this, this blueprint's not right, I can't do this because of some code effort or whatever, and then they change it. Well, the Bible is never going to be wrong, so we need to read it right. It'll never be written wrong, but it will sometimes be misinterpreted or misread. Now, here he says, to add to your faith, to furnish with, to supplement, to build upon. Faith is the foundation. You're building a house, you've got to have a firm, solid foundation. But if that's all you have, you don't ever build it, you don't have a house. You don't have a house. If, if a lady's cooking and she's got her recipe, the recipe is her foundation. If she gets all of her ingredients out and just leaves them there, she doesn't have a product after that. You've got to take the faith and you've got to build on it from a spiritual standpoint. That's what he's talking about here. So we're going to furnish, supplement, and build upon our foundation of faith. And we start with this. These seven things. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Now, some translations will use the words a little different, but I think we all can understand it. Now, these are not in any specific order. It's not that you have to do this first, and then you get this, then you get this, then you get that. And it's not that, well, I'm going to be good, I'm going to be knowledgeable, I'm going to try to console, control myself, but I'm not going to be kind to my brothers. I don't particularly like that guy. Now, I'm not talking about our physical brothers here. I'm talking about our neighbor brothers and all those people. We have to do all of these. It's interesting. The Bible, if you're 70, seven is the number of completion in the Bible, of scriptural or spiritual perfection. So here's what he says we've got to do. We've got to add these. We've got to know what they are. The word in the Greek for goodness is actually the word that we would call for virtue. We normally think of virtue in a moral quality, but it's not just that. It's ethical as well. But it means moral and ethical excellence. You do the very best you can in relation to things that are moral and to things that are ethical. In other words, your personal relationships, your business relationships, your social relationships. You are a person who is good. You have moral and ethical excellence. It also means chastity or purity. And again, we use chastity a lot of times more in a physical form, but it means to be pure. Um, you are who you say you are. You're not a facade. You're the same inside as you are outside. And who you are outside is usually shown by who you are. I mean, who you are inside is usually shown by who you are outside, but we know that sometimes people put up a facade. They act one way, but inside they're really not that way. And you don't know it right away, but as soon as you get to know them a little bit more and get to be around them, pretty soon you see that it's not exactly what it appears to be on the outside. Christians shouldn't be that way. The inside of us should be good, moral and ethical, chaste, and it needs to have beneficial value. The things that we do, that we do, need to be beneficial. They need to be good. Now, to be beneficial means to, to do just that. It has a benefit to you. And it should have a benefit to those around you. So when you think about being good or the adding to your faith goodness, that means how you act. Who you are. You need to be a good person. I hear that. I hear people describe it well time. They're a good person. Now, they may not be talking about being spiritually good, but from a Christian standpoint, we need to be spiritually good. Then we need to be knowledgeable. Now, knowledge just means to know something. But there's three factors here, too. When you really know something, you're familiar with it. Oh, I know how to do that. I've done it a hundred times. We said, I, I know that I know that by experience. You know, I, I'm familiar with it. I, I know what to do with that. We hear that phrase. Sometimes it's, oh, I learned how to do that. In the computer world, you know, you say, I learned how to do that on the computer. Or maybe in, in any world, uh, if you're an apprentice and a, as a plumber or an electrician, you're going to say the same thing. I, I have learned how to do that. You may have also read about it and learned about it that way. And that's the other thing. But more importantly is you need to have an understanding. If I know about it but I don't understand it, it's not as easy for me to comprehend. It's not as easy for me to do. If I know why I'm doing it, I have understanding, it's a little bit easier for me to do. So that's important. We're talking here about scriptural, spiritual knowledge. We need to be familiar enough with the Bible and how it tells us that we are to live, that when a circumstance in life comes up, we know how we're to respond to it. You cannot always help the things that come to your life. You cannot always help the things that happen to you. Now, sometimes you can, but you cannot always help it. But you know what you can always help? How you react to what happens to you. How you respond to it. And are you going to respond in a Christian way or in more of a worldly, human way? And Christians need to learn to respond 
in a Christian way. We need to know what we're supposed to do. We need to be familiar with it because we've learned it and we understand why. Now, I want to remind you here that at least for me, I never will have full understanding of the Bible because it's a pretty complicated blueprint. But as much as I do understand, I want to follow it and I want to be obedient to it. Mark Twain told somebody one time, what the parts about the Bible he didn't understand that bothered him was the parts that he did understand that bothered him. <laughs> we need to, to remember that. Now the third one is self-control. That is temperance. And that means a discipline in our thoughts and our actions. And actions are what we say as well as what we do. It means I have the ability to control. It means I have self-restraint. It means that I control my body, it doesn't control me. I control my thoughts, they don't control me. Now, if your thoughts are pure, of course, there's not an issue here. Now, the issue with, with temperance and self-control is that we are able to discipline our lives so that we don't do the wrong things. We, we are able to, uh, well, we're not always able to discipline our life. We know that because if that was the case, nobody would ever be on a diet, would they? But, <laughs> But that, that's the whole principle is, from a spiritual standpoint, I'm going to be biblically okay. I'm going to be biblically true to what the Word says. I'm going to be able to control my life so that I do not be disobedient to the Word of God. I'm going to be disciplined in my thoughts and my actions. And if, if the Holy Spirit makes me aware that something I'm thinking about, something I'm saying, something I'm doing, is not good, it's not beneficial, then I need to be disciplined enough to say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to quit that. Uh, I'm going to learn from it. And it's an ongoing process, by the way. It's not something you learn with a snap of the finger. The fourth one was perseverance. This means patience. But it's more than just being patient like we think of. It's perseverance. It's endurance beyond normal expectations under difficult circumstances. It means to hold up under. When something really bad is going on and you're kind of underneath it, emotionally, usually we're talking about, you persevere with your Christian attitude, with your Christian faith, with your Christian goodness, you hold up and you persevere beyond what anybody else would expect you to do. Now, the only way we can do that is with the Holy Spirit's help. Remember, one of the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit is that He is an enabler. He's a helper. He's a comforter. He's an enabler. He will see us through things that on our own we can't do. There's a lot we can do on our own, even emotionally. There's no doubt about that. But there will be some circumstances that we cannot do on our own. But when we can, we go to the Holy Spirit we ask the Lord to strengthen us and help us to give us the ability that we need to do it, and He will do that. Perseverance and, and patience in the Greek also means to be constant in your demeanor. It means to be consistent in how you react to things. Consistent in how you live. People need to be able to rely on us. The Lord needs to be able to rely on us to represent Him well. We are His ambassadors, we are often here. We're His witnesses, those that testify for us. Songwriter wrote a song that said, Can the world see Jesus in me? We need to be consistent in our testimony. And our testimony is not just what we say, it's really how we live. That's really our testimony. We need to be consistent in that. We need to be people who are patient or persevere in our Christian walk, no matter what the circumstances are. Then there's the godliness. Now this means holiness. The book of Hebrews tells us to follow after holiness or sanctification in some translations. It basically means the same. Without which, no man will see God. We must pursue holiness. We must continue to try to be godly. We will never be God, but we must continue to live a life that is Christ-like in all that we do. Godliness refers to respect of God and His Word, reverence of God and His Word, and a piety or a devotion to God and His Word. Now, piety has a negative aspect to us sometimes because... We say, oh, well, they think they are so pious. You know, we, we use it negatively, but it shouldn't always be thought of that way. We do need to be pious in relationship to our relationship to God. We need to be people who are Christ-like in all that we do. We need to be godly, following after holiness, remembering that we will never attain perfect holiness, but that should always be our goal, that we are trying, we are striving to be more holy. Jesus said, be ye holy, because I am holy. Do you think he would have given us a commandment that we couldn't, that we could not obey, that we couldn't achieve? Do you tell your four-year-old to go out and change the oil in your car? Do you require them to do something? Now, some of your four-year-olds may have tried to do something, but not because you sent them out to do it. But the expectation is not there that they can accomplish it. But you might tell your 14-year-old to go do it, expecting that your 14-year-old could do it. 
The holiness that, that Christ is talking about is a maturing process. And when we're babes in Christ, He doesn't expect the same level of holiness out of us as He does when we've been walking with the Lord for 20 years or 10 years or 15 or whatever it is. It's a growth process, but we still need to be pursuing holiness. We need to be reverent to God. I think, from my viewpoint, some of the new Bible translations, and I don't want to offend anybody. I use several, by the way, so I'm not stuck on one. This happens to be a new inter international version. But some of the new Bible paraphrases is maybe a better way to, sit, to say it in translation. They make God out to be your bosom buddy. You know, you put him right here by your side and walk right along with him. There's the reverence is gone. You've got to give the King James credit for this, if nothing else. The King James creates a reverence for God when you read the King James. Now, I believe some of the other translations do, too. Like I said, I'm not stuck on one. But I have found that some of these newer ones, they just put God right here. We're, we're, we're equals. We're good buddies. We're not equals with God. He is to be revered by us. He is to be respected by us. He cares for us. He's going to take care of us. But there's no way that, you know, we're bosom buddies walking down the road together side by side as equals. That's not the way it is. Then he talks about brotherly kindness. This is that fraternal affection. We use the word Philadelphia, love for it. Looking out for the welfare of others. Thinking of others before ourselves. Concern for the well-being of others. Uh, Christ talked about this a lot in the New Testament. He gave a lot of parables about how we're to treat others. Then we have the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, he, he did all of these. He looked out for the welfare of others. Now, he sees this one that's by the road. has been beat up and robbed. Two uh, religious people just had walked on by because after all he's a wrong race so they just walked on by but the Samaritan displays brotherly kindness he looked out for his welfare not only did he look out for his immediate welfare when he left him with the innkeeper he said if you have to do anything I'll pay you on my way back so he even looked out for some future welfare and we don't always have an opportunity to do this but it's just the concept of looking out for the welfare of others thinking of others before ourselves we have neighbors all around us. Well, I'm going to do this. Now, out where you guys are, it probably won't have as much effect, but you know sometimes when you live in a town, you get your houses that are just really right next to each other, and you're going to do something. It might actually affect your neighbor, what you're doing. Uh, it might affect them from a noise standpoint. It might affect them from a health standpoint or just a, a, a convenience standpoint. You need to think about that. We need to think about our other neighbors, others before we do ourselves. It's more important from a Christian standpoint that I not offend this person that I make, that, that I make myself happy. We don't offend others. We think of others before ourselves. This does not tell us not to take care of ourselves, by the way. We have that responsibility as Christians, too. And then it says concern for the well-being of others. That's brotherly kindness. Uh, old acronym when I was growing up that the preachers used to talk about, that there was a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness involves external circumstances. Joy involves internal relationships. If you want to have happiness, you've got to deal with the external things going on around you. But if you, you can have joy no matter what the external is because that's an inward relationship with Christ. And the best way to put it, they said, is put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. J-O-Y. That was how they used to tell us. And I've always remembered that and thought it was good. And then the last one is love. This is Christ-like charity. This is agapeo or agape love. It shows benefit, benevolent action beyond normal human expectations. Now, benevolent means to help somebody in a way that increases value. We're to be benevolent people when the Lord gives us that opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody on the street, you go give them everything you got, because if you did that, you don't be able to help one person if you gave them everything you got. But as the Lord leads you to help, that's when you do it. When I become aware of the situation that somebody's in, the first thing I ask the Lord Lord, do you want me to do something about this situation? Now, if he wants me to do something about it, he has already prepared the way for me to do it. He's already made arrangements for me to do it, if he wants me to do it. So I need to say, Lord, do you want me to do it? Well, sometimes it's yes, and I say, but now, Lord, I don't have the ability to help this person. It might not be a financial need. It might be something I just don't know anything about. He will remind me sometimes, yeah, but you know who does. I want you to go tell that person about it so they can help. But he's still up instructing me to be involved in that. Sometimes he tells me, no, this one's not for you. Well, then why didn't you tell me about it? Because I want you to learn to obey me no matter what. When I tell you not to do something, I want you to not do it. Just like when I tell you to do something, I want you to do it. 
It's an obedience thing. So it's a benevolence. And it's caring for others to the extent of giving himself for their well-being. I don't think any of us are going to be called to die for somebody else. But, you know, in the time of war, a lot of people die for other people. We all have heard some war stories where some soldier or soldiers, you know, have given their life to protecting other people or protecting a buddy's life or something like this. In time of war, that's going to happen. But the concept is we need to be willing to give that that we do have. When the Lord gives us that direction, when the Lord says, I want you to do this, we need to learn that we need to care for others to the extent of giving up of self. Maybe the self is what I want to do that day, and I'm not going to be able to do it because the Lord's kind of told me to go help this other person for their well-being. And the third thing that, he, that I have up here is having goodwill toward them in thought, word, and deed. Having goodwill toward them in thought, word, and deed. When Christ was on the cross, there were three things that he did. There were a lot of things he did, but I want to give you three things he did in relation to this Christ's love. He became our sacrifice. He gave himself for us. Nobody else could do that. And there's nobody since him that needs to do that. There's nothing else that needs to happen for us to have the sacrifice for sin. It's already been done. But also remember what he did? He provided for his mother while he was on the cross. He made sure she'd be taken care of. And then he held no grudge against his accusers. He thought still of them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now you say, well, sure they knew what they did. Well, not really. They knew what they were doing at that moment, but they didn't understand the full extent of what was going to happen as a result of what they were doing in persecuting and then crucifying Jesus Christ. So this Christ's love on the cross is the example that we need to think of. I may not have to give up my life, but I might have to give up some of my money, some of my time, some of my effort. I may need to give up some of that for the well-being of others. I need to provide for my family. And then... I don't need to hold grudge against those that cause me trouble. I doubt there's an adult in here that hasn't had someone that's caused them some trouble unjustly now. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about those times you got trouble and you deserved it. I'm talking about those unjust times when somebody said something or did something that really caused you trouble. Might have cost you a job. Might have cost you a relationship with somebody, a friend, so on and so forth. But from a Christian standpoint, we need to learn that we have to say, Father, forgive them. They really don't know. We may think, well, they did know what they were doing, but from a spiritual standpoint, no, they didn't, because Christians don't do those kind of things. Or at least that's what he's, Peter's telling us here that we're not to do. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, and that means that they're ongoing, that, that verb in the Greek means it's active all the time. It's not something that happened once, it's not done. If you increase these qualities, those seven we're talking about, they, they continually mature in you. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Do we all not want to be good, do good things, and have a good reputation? Do we not all want to be helping people? I mean, even non-Christians want to help people. That's why these rich people set up these organizations so they can get money and make them feel good, because they helped somebody. And, of course, they did help somebody. Now, it's temporary as far as the benefit is going to have for them. It's just going to help their earthly reputation, because if they're not a Christian, it's not going to do them any good in heaven. But Christians should also be that way when the Lord provides us the opportunity to do it. They'll keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. We're not saved just to sit around. We're saved to go out and witness, to go out and help, to go out and do all the things that Jesus did. And Jesus helped everybody that he came in contact with that would let him help them. Now, some people aren't going to let you help them. There's not going to be much you can do about it. Even in relationships, you know, the Bible says that you're not to have anything against your brother before you come to the Lord and pray, that it's supposed to be forgiven in your heart at least. But it also says as much as is within you, do it. That doesn't mean that because you want to straighten out something and the other person doesn't, that it'll get straightened out. But as much as is within you, it needs to be straightened out. If they don't want to accept it, if they don't want to be part of it, then they'll have to deal with the Lord when the time comes about that. But as Christians, we need to do our part that we don't have that, so that we can understand that we need to be effective, we need to be productive, we need to be increasing in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and everything he wants us to do in relation to these building blocks. And then the final passage, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Now, all this about making your calling election sure is you, you say you call to be a Christian, you've chosen to be one, well, make sure you're, you're, full, you're following the blueprint. As you're building your spiritual house, make sure that the blueprint's there. Make sure it's right. Because if you get way off on it, you got to go back and undo a bunch of stuff and start over. That's that concept of, well, I didn't get this built right, now i got to tear it down and start over. Now, you can do it, but it, you know, it, it's kind of hard sometimes emotionally when we say, well, I messed up. I need to go back to that person and straighten this out. And that's kind of hard to do sometimes. Now, we'll get it done, but it's a little bit like Chuck Swindoll's book when he says, three steps forward, two steps back, and all this, and, and, and it kind of impedes our progress and as much as possible. We need to always be examining that spiritual blueprint in our Bible to make sure that we're following the example as we should. And if so, we have a promise, two of them here, we'll never fall. You know, if you're out doing all these good things, you're not going to have time to do anything bad. You're not going to have time to mess up if you're always out doing these good things. And you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Right. He'll get to go to heaven. If you're a Christian and heaven isn't important to you, then I, I'm not sure, you know, other than if you're just worried about your earthly reputation, why you're bothering with being in church. <coughs> because the, the, the end goal for all Christians is to go to heaven as opposed to go to hell. Unfortunately, not everybody sees it that way. Do you know that even people that profess to be Christians, not all of them believe in heaven and hell. They just think heaven means a good reputation and hell means a bad reputation. Spoke with a man once who told me that. I, I really couldn't believe it. But that's really what he thought. And he was a professing Christian. Uh, well, he's a professing Baptist anyway. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> In the book of Philippians, Paul wrote to the church of Philippi this. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who's working you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Now, work out means make it evident where people can see it. It doesn't mean work for your salvation. It means work because of your salvation. And James is going to tell us a little bit about that. But the idea of working out your salvation means make it visible to other people. Take what's in you, let the world see. Let the world see Jesus in you, in other words. And James said, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. We do not work to gain our salvation. We work to show our salvation. Because remember, that's all the Jesus some people will ever see. Is us. The Jesus that's in us that is worked out, shown, visibly, outwardly by our life. I want to close with a quote from Matthew Henry. Faith unites the weak believer to Christ as really as it does the strong one. And it purifies the heart of one as truly of the other. The heart of the weak is much the heart of the, of the strong. And every sincere believer is by his faith justified in the sight of God. Faith worketh godliness and produces effects which no other grace in the soul can do. In Christ all fullness dwells and pardon, peace, grace, and knowledge and new principles are thus given through the Holy Spirit. The believer must add knowledge to his virtue, increasing acquaintance with the whole truth and will of God. We must add temperance to knowledge, moderation about worldly things, and add to temperance, patience, and cheerful submission to the will of God. So we add to our faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And these are the building blocks of our spiritual house. And our spiritual house is never finished building. It's something we continually get to build. Many of you have houses that you've added on to as you needed to. Isn't it funny that uh, when you first get married, you've got a smaller house, little kids come home, you need a bigger house. So you either buy a bigger one or you add on to it. But we never go backwards after those kids leave, do we? keep those houses in that same side. Just in case they ever want to come back and visit, of course. And that's good. But our spiritual house can, will be built on as long as we're alive. And, and in all honesty, emotionally and mentally uh, capable of building like you never have to say, what am I going to do when my, house, my spiritual house is fully built? It will never be fully built. Now, you may change some of the things you're doing because of age and health and stuff like that, but our house will be continually built in our spiritual building blocks. Then we have our hymn of invitation. If Jesus Christ is not the Savior of your soul, if He's not the Lord of your life, and His Holy Spirit knocks on your heart's door while we're singing the hymn of invitation, 
right where you stand, you can accept Jesus. You can accept him as your Savior, or you can say, Lord, I haven't had, I'm not all committed to you. I haven't been living under your Lordship. I've been doing kind of things the way I want to. If he's saying, hey, it's time for you to, uh, you know, I know you accepted me as Savior, but you need to accept me as Lord, too. I need to be in control of your life. If he knocks on your heart's door, you can accept him right where you stand. If you need to come forward for public testimony of that, or to join the church, or for baptism, if you need to do that, you can come forward during the hymn of invitation also. Let's stand. I hope if the Holy Spirit talk to your heart during that time when you needed to accept him as Savior, or turn your life over to him as Lord, that you did so. And if you need to make a public testimony about that sometime, I hope you will feel brave enough, free enough, confident enough to do it. Let's remember, to keep building our houses according to God's blueprint, according to spiritual blocks that he's given us to build on. I have a closing prayer and pray for the food because we're going to have a fellowship and I hope everyone will feel free to stay and, and visit. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Father, again, once we thank you for your word and we ask, Father, that you would help us on our spiritual building block to stay true to the blueprint, stay true to the Bible, and that you would help us to, to exhibit these seven qualities that you talked about as far as the building blocks of our life. And if we can realize that if we build upon our faith with these blocks and, and that's how we spend our life doing it, that we will not fall, and that we will be productive, we will be effective in our work for you, no matter what our secular work is, that our life will be a life that's effective and productive for leading others to Jesus Christ. Thank you for this food that we're about to partake of, for the hands that prepared it, strengthen our bodies with it. Thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for what you've given us. We praise you for what's yet to come. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.